Now I request the panel members, uh, Dr. Rabindranath uh, Mehrotra, sir, uh, Dr. Meenakshi Swain, and Dr. Vrinda Agarwal to please come onto the dais. Dr. Rabindranath is a uh, sir is a senior uh, endocrinologist from Apollo Hospital uh, Jubilees. He has published uh, several papers on diabetes growth and osteoporosis. I also call up uh, Dr. Meenakshi Swain. Madam is a senior consultant pathologist uh, in Apollo Hospital and she's a lifetime member of Indian Association of Pathology and Microbiology. Now I request Dr. Vrinda Agarwal. She's an endocrinologist uh, from Care Hospital uh, Hyderabad and she's board certified. So today we will be uh, discussing some important uh, topics on thyroid and uh, parathyroid. Next slide, please. Can you switch the next slide? Yeah. So first is the update on the new WHO uh, classification of thyroid tumors from 2017-2022. There have been a lot of uh, discussion and new additions and renaming of the tumors. So I request uh, Dr. Meenakshi Swain to give a small overview of uh, the WHO classification. Ma'am, please. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth, for having me made, uh, made me a part of this wonderful uh, academic event. I'll quickly, in the next few slides, uh, give you a brief overview of the major changes between 2017 and the 2022 classification. Can I have the first slide, please? Does this work? Yeah. Can we go to the next one? Yeah. So traditionally, thyroid tumors have been named depending on the pattern. And I think most of you would be familiar with these terms. Follicular, when you have these ring-like Oh, I don't think this is working, but the ring-like structures are basically follicular cells arranged in this kind of follicular pattern, give the name to all the follicular patterned lesions, whereas this is to contrast with the papillary pattern which you have on the right side, papilla essentially meaning finger-like processes, as you can see, finger-like processes, and any tumor or lesion which has papillary processes are the papillary pattern lesions. But this changed with molecular pathology coming to the fore, like in most tumors. With molecular pathology, we know that these tumors have distinct molecular signatures, and they're not necessarily just papillary or follicular by architecture. So on the left side, we have the follicular pattern, the typical prototypic multinodular goiter. You have the follicles containing colloid, and that extrapolated to cytology, when you pull them out with a needle, you get these little follicles, micro follicles or macro follicles. Same thing with the papillary. There's a finger-like process there, and that is just a frozen section. This is a permanent section to show you the finger-like processes, like a, the schematic picture on top, and that extrapolated to cytology gives you, again, finger-like processes when we aspirate them. So this was the traditional or conventional definition of thyroid lesions. Now we have moved on with molecular uh, pathology pay, playing a big role, all of us learning a lot more about the molecular genesis behind these lesions because they also fall into groups which either behave well because they have a particular molecular signature or behave badly. And that from there comes up the, uh, I don't know if this uh, pointer is working. You can see in the box, the malignant neoplasms have now been categorized basically depending on the molecular abnormality which have BRAF-like mutations into the papillary carcinomas, and those which have RAS-like mutations into follicular carcinomas. Now, in this is also included the invasive encapsulated follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma because it behaves like a follicular carcinoma, and I'll come to that in a while. So coming to some new terminology, you have to be familiar with this jargon because you will have your pathologist reporting. So we have the introduction of thyroid follicular nodular disease, different as we call it. In short, essentially, 
to include all those lesions that you find multinodular goiter like appearances clinically because that is not a pathologic term but that includes the entire spectrum of mostly benign lesions from hyperplasia, multinodular goiter, thyroiditis to even some follicular adenoma. So hyperplastic to neoplastic which have multiple nodules. Now the next change is that we have now uh, categorically known that the commonest thyroid tumors are derived from the follicular cell. So the con we've concentrated in this uh, classification of the follicular cell derived neoplasms where you have benign, low grade and malignant and this is different from the earlier classification. This helps you actually follow up the low grade a little more stringently because you know that though they are low grade, they have a propensity to late metastasis. So that is the whole idea behind dividing it into these three categories. Then we have another big change is in the high grade group. There's a third point that I've enumerated. The follicular derived carcinomas high grade can be of two types. We have only known them traditionally to be poorly differentiated, which was a traditional poorly differentiated carcinoma. But we have now also a differentiated high grade th thyroid carcinoma, which are slightly different and I have elaborated that in the next slide. The most important change is also with grading of medullary. There are criteria now for grading based on necrosis, mitosis, and KI67. So an IHC requires, is required to make the grading easier and more reproducible. There's a new entity, thyroblastoma, which is in, seen in dicer mutation associated lesions, predominantly in children. This was not there earlier. And now with more and more molecular coming up with the dicer mutations, we know a lot of blastomas like even pituitary blastoma, which is dicer muted, uh, mutant related. So also thyroblastoma and the thyroid. Then we have the last very important group. Squamous cell carcinoma of the thyroid was an entity by itself until 2017. But now again, because we've studied them extensively molecularly, we know that most of these which have squamous differentiation essentially behave like anaplastic carcinomas. And there are big series to support that. And therefore there's a reclassification now. The thought is that all squamous or anything that looks squamous in the thyroid actually behaves like anaplastic. So it's equal to anaplastic. And that's a very important point that you need to remember. This is just from the paper to show you uh, that we have these three categories, like I mentioned, benign, low risk, and malignant. The low risk is a new addition, which includes those entities like non-invasive NIFTP in short, thyroid tumors of uncertain malignant potential, and hyaluronizing trabecular tumor. Very important because long-term follow-up is required. They are benign per se, but they have a propensity to late metastasis, so you have to keep them on follow-up. Malignant, of course, hasn't changed too much, but I put it, highlighted the group that I just mentioned, the high grade can be either differentiated high grade or the traditional poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Now that we have some criteria pathologically to differentiate between what was the traditional poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma from differentiated high grade mitosis and necrosis, which may not interest you, but that is really important for us pathologists to give you that diagnosis. And just to remember that this group of, of high grade follicular, which includes the poly differentiated and differentiated high grade, falls in between anaplastic on the bad side and the better differentiated ones on the left hand side. So it is intermediate in prognosis. That is what is important to remember. This is just to highlight that medullary carcinomas are now graded and there are criteria to grade them depending on these three morphologic features. This is the rest which has been reorganized a bit. You have a mixed medullary and follicular, then you have salivary type uh, carcinomas, and you also have the new entity highlighted in blue, which is a thyroid blastoma, and I've already told you. Just to reiterate this point, if you find squamous differentiation, it's an anaplastic carcinoma. So that's about the important changes from the 2017 to the fifth edition of the WHO. Yeah, earlier, uh, follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma uh, was also a variant of uh, PTC. Right. Now, uh, I think it has been taken out from papillary thyroid and I don't know where is it now. Can you please explain? Yeah, correct. So again, it, the basis is molecular. Follicular variant of papillary was called so because it didn't have those finger-like processes, but it had nuclear features of papillary. So all of us know that traditionally papillary carcinoma has certain nuclear signatures, intranuclear inclusions, nuclear grooves, overlapping, clearing. Now, when there is a tumor which does not have papillae, is arranged like follicles, but it has nuclear features of a papillary, it used to be called follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. But now we have two subtypes in that. There is an infiltrative type of follicular variant where there are no papillae. It is in follicles. It has the nuclear features of papillary, but it tends to infiltrate. So that is traditionally, again, BRAF mutated, and it is still classified with papillary carcinomas, PTCs. But then there is that group of follicular, which actually is called invasive encapsulated follicular variant of PTC, meaning there's a capsule 
and if it invades it invades like a follicular carcinoma so it goes across the capsule goes into the vessels and it's not typically infiltrative like the regular ptc and that is actually has a molecular signature of ras like mutations so it identifies actually with the follicular carcinomas because again molecularly they're similar they also behave similarly so that group is now actually the follicular variant of ptc so which is different molecularly behaves differently from the regular infiltrative follicular variant of ptc and that's the reason again a molecular basis for separating these two entities and also the confusing uh, thing for the clinicians is uh, when you come to the fine needle aspiration cytology it is the category 3 fnac now they have said you have category 3a and uh, 3b so which patients to actually keep them on follow up with uh, category 3 fnac whether uh, i mean it right. becomes a big confusion so a lot of a lot of the patients even though they have papillary thyroid carcinoma uh, they've been kept on follow up thanks to the biology of the disease that it's not an aggressive one we are still okay with it but how to uh, you know select the patients and refer them for surgery right so category 3 is actually um, a relief for the pathologist but i know it puts you into a quandary because you don't know what to do do you follow them up do you excise them what is the best option there so basically category 3 is one which is intermediate between benign and malignant so we do not have frank malignant features and we are not able to clearly call it a benign lesion that is what falls into category 3 for a cytologist now i understand that the implications are different and difficult for you but we tend to therefore push things like i have a few images if i can just share with you this was the original tbs system with six categories which has now undergone three modifications with the latest one in 2023 which is the third edition the there's not too much of change as far as the category 6 which is malignant is concerned and suspicious for malignancy because there you are actually considering a malignant lesion but the problem comes in categories 3 and 4 because what do we do how do we follow up do we actually subject all of them to a lobectomy or no so to make things easy i'll just show you what we call category 3 essentially category 3 is and in this era of guided fnacs what happens is often we just get the smears which are not always the best their smears are not of of good quality you can see on the top two there's a lot of blood and all those cells are caught up and we really can't see the morphology so we need to see the cytoplasm the nucleus and all the features to give you a clear cut diagnosis of malignancy when we are not able to do that and you say it's a solid cystic nodule then we are worried about a cystic papillary that's when we would probably put it in category 3 which is otherwise known as AUS or atypical uh, atp of undetermined significance it was also called follicular lesion of undetermined significance that has now been dropped out that's why i have sort of put it in gray that is dropped out in the 2023 so we are going to call them only AUS atp of undetermined significance and you look at the second picture on the left there's so much of nuclear size variation so that that is concerning for a malignant process not always and there is also what looks like an intranuclear inclusion but that's not a diffuse change so there is some atp but not enough to call it a ptc that's when we would dump it into category 3 but we are certainly concerned so it's often the nuclear features which are worrisome rather than cytoplasmic features and we don't see architecture in cytology so we rely heavily on nuclear features to make a diagnosis of a papillary c c a excuse me and if you look at the picture on the left again there is some variation in size of the nuclei so when there's variation in size you are worried concerned about a malignancy but we probably do not have access to the radiologic findings we do not know where to put it then we actually put it in category 3 to alert you that please follow this patient up definitely correlate with radiology if there is any worrisome feature is it a solid cystic nodule subject to lobectomy it is always better to be safe than sorry so you could do that and wait now to ease matters actually the ed, uh, the new edition has now classified these sub classified aus into two categories those with nuclear atp and those without atp again for the same reason so that we are able to increase the positive predictive value if we look more strictly at criteria for nuclear atp which may be more suspicious for a papillary we may still be able to actually be a little closer to closer to the reality and therefore it's been found in studies that those which have nuclear atp the risk of malignancy goes as as high as 45% so that is why stringent criteria i mean we are trying to reduce the number of this waste basket category basically to try and aid patient management now i'll quickly cover category 4 though dr siddarth hasn't really asked for it because this is one where we suspect a follicular neoplasm 
But now the current trend is to drop the word suspicious. Just look at this picture to show these are repetitive microfollicles which the cytologist relies on for making a diagnosis of a neoplastic lesion, usually in the absence of too much colloid. There's a lot of nuclear overlapping and there are tiny follicles. Then you're worried about, and nuclear features of PTC are not seen. Then we are worried about a, ne a follicular neoplasm. Again, neoplasm, not adenoma versus carcinoma, we can't tell you, because those are architectural features which can only be done on permanent sections. So we can tell you that yes, probably this is a follicular neoplasm. There is a caveat there, and a major limitation is a dominant nodule of a colloid goiter. You have multiple nodules, and you have actually sampled the one which looked solid. You don't obviously sample all of them. And the solid one, if we do not know, is part of a multinodular picture, can be mistaken for follicular neoplasm. It would look identical. And there's no easy way of telling the two apart. So that is when we need your input. We need the radiology. We need to know as a patient hypothyroid. What about the thyro antithyroid antibodies? Are they positive? Then it could be, well be a nodule in a Hashimoto's. So that's why we sometimes bug you which to your annoyance, I'm sure, but we really need those findings to try and tell you whether we are dealing with something malignant, something neoplastic versus something benign. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So. So now we move on to the next topic that is the ultrasound and uh, thyroid. Uh, ultrasound for the endocrinologist and uh, thyroid surgeon should be like the stethoscope of the uh, cardiologist. So it's very important. Everyone should uh, be familiar by, by, for using the ultrasound. Now I request uh, Dr. Brinda to give an overview uh, of the ACR uh, thyroid scoring. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Um, so, um, we, uh, like Dr. Siddharth actually already mentioned that thyroid ultrasound is something I think uh, is like the stethoscope for all of us. We uh, use it basically to confirm if there is a thyroid nodule, how does it look? And uh, is there, um, you know, any concern about it? So, does it need uh, further assessment in terms of uh, uh, fine needle aspiration cytology to confirm whether it's benign or malignant. Um, as the data says, most are benign and, um, you know, even malignant nodules, uh, you know, mostly are, say, less than one centimeters. And um, uh, again, you know, the role of the ultrasound is to help delineate like which nodules would actually uh, require further assessment, further management, do they require cytology, uh, you know, would they be malignant, would, uh, what would be the further ramifications of um, these nodules. So, um, well, uh, this is just a brief overview of how like Tyrad system came around. And, uh, you know, currently, um, you know, what um, most commonly we talk about is the American uh, College of Radiology Tyrads, which uh, came out in 2017. Well, um, so uh, what essentially is Tyrads is uh, that ACR proposed that there should be a standardized way of, you know, um, presenting these thyroid nodules, um, you know, to anybody to essentially understand, like, you know, a numeric system to understand, like, you know, which ones would be categorized as concerning uh, malignant and which ones would be categorized as more benign. And this could further, uh, you know, help with the uh, management recommendations. And this would es essentially uh, prevent unnecessary biopsies and, um, you know, uh, help uh, the physician uh, to talk about prognostication. So um, when we talk about the Tyrad system, it goes on from Tyrads 1 to 5. And uh, essentially, 1 to 5 also signifies a worsening risk for malignancy. So when we talk about the malignancy rates for Tyrads 1, it's uh, very minimal, 0.3%. And when we go on to Tyrads 5, we're talking about 35% uh, risk of malignancy. And uh, this, um, you know, a very common slide, I think a lot of us might have already seen, but this is essentially, um, you know, what Tyrads does. So um, certain ultrasonic, um, ultrasonography features of uh, the thyroid nodules, uh, we look at them and then we give them points. 
So if uh, let's say there is a completely cystic uh, nodule, uh, it will have zero points. And then if it's a completely solid uh, nodule, then it will be two points assigned to it. So similarly, we talk about echogenicity, hypoechoic being two points, very hypoechoic being three points. We talk about the shape, taller than wide gains three points. We talk about margins and uh, irregular margins uh, get two points. And then we talk about the echogenic foci. We talk about my presence of microcalcifications, macrocalcifications, etc. So we add on these points uh, from the um, uh, ultrasonographic picture of these uh, thyroid nodules and we ca calculate a cumulative score. And uh, that is how we categorize them as tyrads 1 to 5. So tyrads 5, as it's mentioned here, highly suspicious. We propose for FNA if the nodule is more than 1 centimeters. If, um, you know, for tyrads uh, one, essentially no FNA is recommended. So um, a few assumptions, uh, you know, essentially if uh, the rim calcifications are present such that they obscure a very clear view of the nodule, then um, we choose the composition to be defined as solid and the echogenicity to be isoechoic. If the margin cannot be determined very clearly, we choose uh, to use the term ill-defined margin. If echogenicity cannot be determined, we choose the term isoechoic. And if composition cannot be determined, we choose the composition to be solid. Um, I'll just um, move on, uh, you know, so just a quick word about uh, uh, doing um, FNA, uh, you know, which uh, nodules essentially would uh, meet the criteria uh, for doing FNA. So when we define these nodules on the ultrasound, we are looking for essentially a few features. So uh, remember, not one ultrasonographic feature defines uh, benign versus malignant. It's usually, uh, you know, a group of features coming together which may make a nodule more suspicious or less suspicious for malignancy. So um, FNA is uh, the tool we have in hand uh, to, you know, prevent unnecessary surgeries and to identify nodules which may uh, benefit from, um, you know, surgical uh, removal. So those which we categorize as highly suspicious nodules are the ones which are solid, hypoechoic, um, you know, they have irregular margins, they have my microcalcifications, could be taller than wide, and, uh, you know, have any evidence of extra thyroidal extension. They would carry a risk of more than 70 to 90 percent of uh, harboring a malignancy. And so we do recommend an FNA uh, if the size of the nodule is more than one centimeters. Um, for those with intermediate suspicion, uh, hypoechoic solid nodules with smooth margins and without any further features, those were cat uh, with like, uh, you know, microcalcifications, extrathyroidal uh, extension, irregular margins. So the high risk features are not present. So they would be called as intermediate suspicious nodules. And again, FNA is recommended for those for more than one centimeters. Um, those with, the, um, you know, low suspicion are the ones which are isoechoic, hyperechoic, partially cystic nodules without any high risk features. For those, we recommend FNA at more than 1.5 centimeters. Um, purely cystic nodules are essentially benign. We do not recommend FNA of those nodules. And then the low suspicion ones are the spongiform nodules, which we usually say more than two centimeters would be considered for biopsy. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Brinda. So now uh, we all move on to the most uh, dreaded uh, complication uh, like hypoparathyroidism following uh, total thyroidectomy is one of the most common complication and uh, rates of postoperative hypocalcemia temporary hypocalcemia can be up to 35% uh, permanent hypocalcemia defined as even after 6 months if the patient is having uh, hypocalcemia it is permanent seen in 1 to 6% so, as a surgeon, we, we regard every parathyroid as the last surviving parathyroid. So, it's very important and uh, you have to handle it very delicately and it is very difficult to see, it, treat this uh, permanent uh, hypoparathyroidism. So, I request Dr. Mehrothra sir to talk about the post-operative management of hypoparathyroidism. 
thank you dr siddharth and dr idea clinics for calling me here this is a, a important thing that normally we see in our practice the post op uh, hypoparia and how to prevent it and how to the main thing is to anticipate the uh, problem uh, when somebody is, when you see a patient that patient is planned for a bilateral neck exploration patient has got ca thyroid with bilateral lymph nodes or patient is a grave disease going for thyroidectomy these are the patients which are going to be uh, at more of risk for hypocalcemia then come the patients who are basically being operated by low volume surgeons or patient having history of malabsorption or bariatric surgeries these patients are more prone to have hypocalcemia if you look at the workup of post op hypocalcemia the most important thing to look at is initially the magnesium first if the magnesium is low you treat the magnesium the calcium become normal the problem is solved you need not evaluate further if magnesium is normal the problem still remain then look at the phosphorus if the phosphorus is high that means the other damage to the parathyroid blood supply then the question come it could be transitory which is less than 6 month or could be permanent that is more than 6 months now how do we evaluate further than this can we predict who will be needing long term admission or who can be discharged in a day or two then come the role of in the post op pth we do intra pth for hyperparia patients but becoming more recognized now ki we should do a post op pth for thyroidectomy patients if the pth is more than 20 and the calcium is more than 8 patient can be discharged very safely on oral calcium supplement nothing more is required if the pth is less than 10 and calcium is less than 8 definitely he'll require a calcitriol 125 vitamin d with calcium uh, supplements If the, if the borderline pth is 11 to 19 and calcium is between say less than 8 or around 7.5 they will need a calcium supplementation and a calcitriol on a close follow up to decide when to discharge them the management basically depend upon the patient symptoms you patient if symptomatic will require a iv calcium initially and then they can be put on either on a oral or a iv infusion the, the problem comes uh, you give them one dose you go give only calcium sub the infusions like 6th hourly or 8th hourly that will not maintain the calcium you give a initial bolus dose of calcium supplements uh, iv calcium maybe one ampule or 90 mg of calcium in 150 mg of 50 ml of dextrose over a period of 15 20 minutes and then put them on a low dose infusion now infusion basically is cratically prepared 1 mg per ml and start at the rate of 30 to 50 ml per hour then titrate the dose accordingly in the meantime you can put them on 125 vitamin d calcium look at the uh, look at the magnesium put them on a low phosphorus diet and manage it but they will require at least 2 uh, to 3 grams of calcium and uh, 125 vitamin d of say 1 microgram per day to maintain the calcium for some time the question come when to start the pth injection that is sometime a question to be answered if sometime we have we are reach the oral calcium of say 5 to 6 mg and a 125 vitamin d of more than 2.5 to 4 3 and still patient is having symptomatic hypocalcemia then we have to consider putting them on a teriparatide which could be a transitory one and uh, in last 6 months we had three patients who required teriparatide but they luckily went off the pth injection within 2 to 3 months so post op hypoparia is sometime difficult to treat the question comes to choose the high volume surgeons they are more experienced in looking at the parathyroid preserving the blood supply preserving the and giving you a note in the pathology report ki ha parathyroid has been preserved that is quite assuring we go on to the normal calcemic the another activity when we do a parathyroidectomy and uh, it sometimes becomes very difficult if you have a, a tertiary hyperparia and i know he definitely will go into severe hypocalcemia but some patients we we also had i mean like do, after doing a parathyroidectomy the bmd was low and uh, they go into this uh, spasms uh, and uh, i remember for one patient i had to give five calcium gluconates Uh, slowly over a period of one and a half hour then only it got relieved the spasm got relieved so how to predict which patient uh, following parathyroidectomy can go into this hungry bone uh, syndrome anything yeah if you look at the uh, indian parathyroid patients who are been uh, picked up and treated they tend to have larger uh, parathyroid glands they tend to be having more low vitamin d deficiency they have high alk force a patient with high alk force and a bigger parathyroid nodule will definitely going to a 
hungry bone syndrome and will require IV support for some time. So the basic thing is to look for the and some patients say look at the pre-op calcium. The calcium the the, the higher the calcium pre-op, most likely he will fall post-op. So high calcium, high alphas, low vitamin D, large gland size can to some extent predict your patient who will go into hungry bone syndrome. Now uh, everybody knows how to manage this primary hyperparathyroidism. You have a elevated calcium, elevated PTH, you know what to do. And then you got this asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism where there is no end organ damage. Now with the health seeking individuals and the software people, too many health tests being done and you come up with this entity called normocalcemic uh, primary hyperparathyroidism where the calcium is normal and uh, the PTH is high and when you see uh, there is no end organ uh, damage and when you image you may or you may not find and the patient is quite anxious. It's a new entity, I think it came out in uh, 2008 in the Bilzik and the conference of the parathyroid. Can you please update on the management of this normocalcemic cell? Yeah, now, but this basically the term comes key when patients calcium the normal and the PTH is high. We know that the calcium measurement can be affected by the low albumin levels. So first we say the definition means the albumin corrected calcium should be normal and the PTH should be high. It's not that the patient has a low albumin, low calcium and the PTH is high. So first you correct the albumin uh, for the values of the cal calcium for the albumin. If still the calcium is normal and the PTH is high, then you can entertain this entity of normal calcemic. Remember this entity is basically a diagnosis of exclusion. Before we go ahead and say that it is normal calcemic, look at the vitamin D levels. Anything uh, vitamin D, the, if you look at the vitamin D levels are low, you may have a calcium which is normal or low normal and the PTH be high. So before we go ahead, we should maintain the calcium at least above 30 for 3 months, relook at the PTH and then say, if we have given vitamin D for 3 months, the PTH becomes normal, this is not uh, normal calcium hyperpara, it was only secondary hyperpara. In case after despite 3 months, calcium being the adequate vitamin D supplementation, the PTH is still high, then you can enter into this the, ter the terminology of normal calcemic. Then the most important, second important cause is the uh, patient on bisphosphonates and uh, denosumab and diuretics. Now we know that the bisphosphonates and denosumab decreases the bone turnover, they decrease the bone calcium resorption, so they tend to elevate the PTH patient on therapy. So it's better always to look at the PTH and calcium values before starting them on therapy. So that the confusion doesn't arise. Ki, okay, today my patient is on a bisphosphonate, I've given them two injections of zoonotic acid, then it comes the calcium of say 9 and a PTH of 120. But if you go back and look at the start of the therapy, if the calcium PTH was normal, then we do not consider this as a normal calcium of hyperbara. But sometime you may have a situation where we don't have the pre-starting pre therapy of PTH, now you have a PTH high and a calcium which is normal, vitamin D is normal, then the authors say you should look at withdrawing the bisphosphonate in a map. Now, but they do have a long half-life. Bisphosphonate stay in the system for more than years. So there I am not very sure how to withdraw it. There the decision has to be based on a case-to-case -case basis. A patient is on therapy, look at the BMD values. If BMD is stable, we do not interfere further. If the BMD is falling, then you may consider doing imaging after that. The third important cause if we could be to look at the diuretics or the hypercalcuria. Somebody having hypercalcuria will have a high PTH. So they will have normal calcium, high urinary calcium, and high PTH. So in that case, you can give a trial of thyroid. If thyroid normalizes the urine calcium and the PTH comes back to normal, it was hypercalcuria, we need not investigate or treat further than that. Then come the patients having uh, impaired renal function. Then this is the elderly population. At the age, the GR fall will decline. As the GFR will decline, PTH is bound to go up. So you will find a lot of situations where creatinine is borderline, GFR is around 40 to 50, calcium is around 8.5 to 9, and PTH is around 79 to 100, somewhere between that. So in that case, uh, you can give a short trial of 125 vitamin D. If it is the, because of CKD, the PTH will go down. You can stop evaluating from that point of view and treat the patient as a part of CKD, follow up. Patient undergoing bariatric surgeries or malabsorption, they will have low vitamin D to treat that problem first and then look at the calcium and PTH. Once you have done that 
and then follow up this patient for the uh, the manifestation that primary hyperpara may have. So the follow up become like this. We know that the PTH can affect symptomatically the your patient's um, uh, mental, uh, the neurocognitive functions, uh, anemia, cardiac vascular functions, uh, BMDs, uh, renal functions, and uh, urinary calcium. Where you get kidney stones. So a patient has got normal calcium, uh, high PTH without any secondary cause of hyperpara have been ruled out. They've been in the follow-up for more than five to six months. We have excluded the malabsorption. We have excluded the CKD. We have excluded the hypercalcuria. We have excluded the possibility of uh, um, uh, vitamin D deficiency. This is, is ionized calcium is normal and albumin corrected calcium is normal. Then we follow up these patients. Do not jump to imaging. If you do an image, you land up in a problem. So basically, thing is follow up the patient's BMD, follow up the renal functions, follow up the hemoglobin and the cardiovascular functions, and then see. If the patient shows a decline in the BMD, decline in the GFR, or calcium is becoming hypercalcemic, 30% of these patients in follow up will develop hypercalcemia. So if they're developing hypercalcemia or BMD is declining, declining GFR or recurrent kidney stone, then you may consider a surgical option. So before doing a surgical option, you go for an imaging like any other primary hyperpara patients. If the patient meets the criteria, then you go for a surgery. But remember that these patients tend to have multi-gland disease. They may not always have a single adenoma. They may tend to have more of multi-gland disease where you may not, you may, you find, you may find discounted imagings. So these patients may require a bilateral exploration. So before you make a decision of bilateral exploration, so be confident that you are treating the correct entity. In the, even in the intraop, the PTH will tend to decline a little slowly. Normally, we look at the PTH values of 10 to 15 minutes or 20 minutes. But here it been advised, look at the PTH, PTH value post-op of even 30 minutes to define the criteria for cure. If they don't meet the criteria for surgery, you can put them on a follow-up. Treat with bisphosphonates to preserve the bone density. You may use senacalcid, but senacalcid is not shown to have shown much benefit. What is shown to have a bisphosphonate which can preserve the bone density? In case patient is developing hypercalcemia or developing the declining renal function or declining BMD, then we need to show that we are planning for a surgery. Follow-up is basically based on calcium every year, DEXA every year, and other tests for the requirement of the symptoms every year. The yearly follow-up is the most important. Thank you, sir.